Welcome to the second lecture covering chapter one of our textbook. Uh, when we were last together, we were discussing um, the parts of a, a published decision uh, made by a judge, uh, part of the common law, in other words, and we discussed the various parts of that decision. Now we're going to discuss another uh, document that is oftentimes used by judges in rendering uh, the decisions of their court, and that is the uh, restatements. We talked about this in the first lecture, so this is uh, just kind of solidifying what we've already uh, found out about this particular document. Here's what one of these look like. It, uh, a restatement is published by the American Law Institute. It's a private entity, a nonprofit entity. <clears throat> Uh, law professors are the usual people who uh, prepare these restatements. And here is from our textbook. Again, you can see this is a definitional term, so you'll want to learn this term. Um, it, a restatement is a compilation of general areas of law by the American Law Institute, which is commonly called the ALI. Each restatement covers a discrete legal subject. So we have the restatement of contracts. Actually, we're on the second restatement, I believe. Okay, one thing that you need to know about restatements are that they are very persuasive. Courts love restatements. They know that it's pretty common that the restatements get the law right. But even though they have a lot of weight, they are not binding on courts. These would just be um, persuasive precedents. So remember we we talked about the difference between persuasive and binding precedents. Well this would be a persuasive precedent because it's not a primary source of law. Um, in our first lecture we talked about uh, uh, so what so what a restatement is is persuasive not binding. Let me flip to an earlier slide so we can get a little bit of a review about these terms. Okay so we're deciding that uh, restatements are persuasive authorities. Here we go, went too far I think. And that is because they are not primary sources of law. All of these are made by somebody in the government who has the capacity, the authority to rule in a particular area. But again, this is a private entity. And so we call these secondary sources of law. Now this is a really powerful secondary source of law. Um, obviously, let's say I, if um, Bob, my next door neighbor, were to write a, um, a document summarizing the law, well, Bob isn't an attorney. He doesn't have any particular legal training. Um, his document would not change the law it would not be viewed as very persuasive by too many people. Um, it would be a secondary source of law. But let's say Bob, my next door neighbor, went to law school, uh, practiced as an attorney, became a judge, and he renders decisions from the bench. Well now, his decisions from the bench are primary source of law. When he's you know, sitting back on his back porch talking about the law with his buddies, that would still be a secondary source of law because he's just shooting the breeze. It may be about legal topics, but it's not, he isn't wearing his judicial robes at that time. So restatements are persuasive precedents. They are secondary sources of law, but they can be cited in uh, uh, briefs and other documents that are, are sent to courts and courts uh, will quote uh, restatements fairly often. So they are very, very persuasive secondary source, but they are still secondary sources. And we talked before in our first lecture about what a restatement is. It's uh, a, a way that the law has been organized, kind of like the way a statute would look if our state legislature decided, hey, we want to pass a statute that codifies or describes the common laws that currently exist. Now, our legislature hasn't expressed an interest in doing that, and I don't think our legislature ever will do something like that. I don't know of any state that has done that. But this is almost as if a state legislature decided to do that. Restatements try to capture black letter law. Black letter law is a term that you'll oftentimes hear in the law, and um, you are responsible for knowing this term. Again, it's in red, and this is the idea that the, these are um, legal principles that are fundamental and well established. Everybody agrees about this stuff. You know, there are some areas of law that 
are in the gray, right? Well, something in the gray or that's a little bit uncertain or open to interpretation or reasonable people might differ on, what's in the gray can't be black letter law. When we talk about black letter law, we're talking about something that everybody agrees about, everybody who's in the legal know. I mean, obviously not Joe's citizen on the street, but people who, who are in this profession, that would be what a black letter law principle would be. So you would expect there to be a lot of agreement, you know, 90% plus agreement amongst legal scholars in that particular discipline. Say, yep, that's what the rule is. Okay, let's talk about the UCC, the Uniform Commercial Code. Again, this is something we'll probably be spending eh, 25-30% of the semester on, but it'll be more towards the back half of the semester. So we'll talk about it occasionally in the first half, but it won't be as common a topic. Uh, this is a good definition to get us started, and we'll again add a lot more granularity to this topic as we progress. So what is the Uniform Commercial Code? It's a statutory contract law that has been adopted in whole or part by all of the states. So this is um, taking contract law that was in the common law and writing it up in a statute form. Let's look at the term Uniform Commercial Code for a second and let's kind of dissect what's going on here. Let's go to the very end, code. When we see the word code, and we're using in the legal context, obviously we're not talking about Morse code or um, some type of code like that. We're talking about uh, a code is a systematic topical arrangement of statutes. For example, a penal code is, are a bunch of laws grouped together that have to do with crimes. Uh, the family code, in Texas would be that bunch of statutes that are all organized together that have to do with family law, uh, marriage, divorce, child custody, child support, division of assets, all those topics. The probate code would be the code that talks about um, how we're going to divide up the assets of somebody who dies with a will or without a will, those types of things. So this is when we see the word code, we know we're talking about a statute, and we know that the statute is about a particular topic. So that's what we know when we see this word. Let's go to the next word, commercial. Well, obviously, when you see the word commercial, you see the word commerce. So this is involved with um, uh, economic activities, commerce, buying and selling, that type of idea. Um, so these are particular types of contracts. Not every single contract um, fits under the title of commerce. And we'll talk more going forward about which types of contracts fit under the UCC and which types of contracts fit under the, uh, the common law. Uh, but this is the, the kind of the dividing line. Is it commerce or is it not? Now let's look at our last word. So we've talked about commerce. Let's talk about uniform. Now, when we use the word uniform here, we're not talking about something you wear, um, if you're a soldier or something like that. We're also, um, or I guess we're talking about it more from the perspective of uniform meaning consistent. Um, he applied that rule in a uniform manner, meaning he applied the rule in exactly the same way time and time again. And after all, that's where the term uniform comes from in the, in the military. We call it a uniform because everyone is dressed the same way. Bob is in uh, the khakis and Larry's in the khakis and Teresa's in the khakis and Susan's in the khakis, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they are all uniform. They're all dressed the same way. So what do we mean when we say uniform here? Well, obviously every state has its own version of its statutes. So Texas statutes aren't identical to statutes in Oklahoma or Louisiana or Wyoming or Massachusetts or Alaska. Each state has its own set of laws. But sometimes it makes sense for states to agree on certain topics. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it, it really there's no reason to have a particular policy that's exactly the same. Um, for example, it might not make sense uh, for states to agree about gambling. 
So for example, the state of Nevada might decide, yeah, we think gambling is a good thing for us to have. It brings in revenue and uh, we think that it's positive for our state. Okay, but just because Nevada thinks it's a great idea doesn't necessarily mean that Arizona and Utah and California and New Mexico and Texas and Wyoming and all the other states are going to agree. And it's okay if they don't. It's okay for Texas to say, you know what? We don't think gambling is such a great idea. Or we think it's okay sometimes, like, for example, with the lottery or with a parimutuel betting. But we don't think... Um, uh, gambling in the sense of uh, poker and slot machines are a good idea. And it's okay for other states to come up with other answers. We don't need to have one answer in all the states. So in that situation, we don't really need a uniform statute because each state can kind of go its own way. Um, Nevada is okay with the fact that Texas doesn't have gambling. In fact, they probably like it because it means Texans actually travel to Nevada to, uh, to engage in that behavior. Texans are probably okay with Nevada having gambling because after all, it means that there's probably less illegal gambling in Texas because people who really want to gamble can just go to Nevada. So it kind of actually serves our purposes for there to be a lack of uniformity in this area. But sometimes it's a good idea to have one answer for all the states. And when we're looking at a commercial code, it's kind of a good idea. Now the commercial code was not developed um, in the post Amazon world, but let's just think about if you were a member of the legal department at Amazon, and let's assume that we didn't have a UCC, we didn't have a uniform commercial code, that each state had its own answer to the question about how we're gonna transact business. Well, think about it. Uh, Amazon puts up this website and somebody from the state of Kentucky wants to buy a book or something from Amazon. Well, what laws apply? Is it Washington state law where Amazon is located? Or is it Kentucky law? Or, and let's say that the warehouse is actually going to fulfill that, who is actually has that book that is going to be sent to that Kentucky home, that warehouse is located in Tennessee. So maybe Tennessee law controls. Um, maybe the server that handles the transaction for Amazon actually is located in Ohio. So maybe Ohio is a law where it counts. You can see there's all of these questions. And think about every single one of the transactions that Amazon gets involved with. Um, you're gonna have all those questions. So somebody from uh, California buys um, something from Amazon. Those exact same questions come up. And so you can imagine if there's going to be a different answer depending upon what warehouse fulfills it or where the customer is located or all those other issues, it's a really complicated question and a, a complicated programming issue for Amazon to figure out what rules apply and how it needs to be documented and how that needs to proceed. I mean, it's kind of a good thing for legal professionals, more business for us, right? But um, it's not very efficient for the economy. It's much better for the economy or for the, the legal business or for the Amazon business, let me put it that way, to say, you know what, we don't care whether you're in Kentucky or California or Ohio or Tennessee or anywhere in the 50 states, the same rule applies. So we can treat somebody in Florida exactly the same way we treat somebody in Nebraska. The same rule applies. So we don't have to do all that extra coding or worry about where we're going to build our warehouses or anything along those lines. That saves a lot of money. It reduces uncertainty because, again, you don't have to worry about, well, now is it where the buyer is or is it what the seller is or where is it where the transaction occurred in the Ethernet or is it where the item was located? You don't have to know any of those answers. It doesn't matter because the answer is the same wherever it happens. So that uniformity reduces the transaction costs and it also reduces the uncertainty. And one of the big things we don't want in business is we don't want there to be uncertainty. And so contract law is really designed to reduce that to as much as humanly possible. That's really a governing principle. And so sometimes the answer that we come up with in contract law is X, whatever X might be. And you and I might look at that and go, gosh, 
uh, I don't think X is the best answer. I think Y would be a better answer. And you know what? We might be right. Why might be a better answer? But you know what? It's not so important that contract law makes the right choice. It's not so important that contract law picks Y over X. What's important is that we have a definite answer, a very clear, unambiguous, easy to apply answer. Even if that answer isn't best, because, and this is one of the wonderful things about contract law, is that you can work around the rules. Once you know what the rules are, but you know what, when you don't know what the rules are, you can't work around it. Imagine for a second that um, I am traveling on a trip. I am going from, uh, um, I uh, live at Coit, and El Dorado in Frisco, and I want to go to uh, Spring Creek and Preston in Plano. That's my ultimate uh, destination, okay? And I uh, happen to know that there's a lot of construction on Preston um, just uh, uh, right around Legacy. And that has caused there to be lots of um, slower traffic because of this construction. Well, you know what I might do? I might decide to go another way. I might decide to go down Coit all the way to Spring Creek. But let's say I'm going to go to that same location six months later. And you know what? This time I happen to know that there's a big construction project at 121 in Coit. So this time, I'm not going to go down Coit. I'm going to, going to go down Preston Road. That's my faster path. Well, that's what we do in the law and contract law. We know what the rules are, and so we're able to maneuver. But let's say I didn't know where the construction was. I uh, just, just don't ever go south um, on the road. And so I don't know whether the construction is bad on Preston or bad on Coit. Because I don't know, I may end up getting snarled up in traffic. If I know where the bottlenecks are, if I know what the rules are, I can avoid the problem. But I have to know what the rules are in order to avoid it. And that's why we care not so much about having the perfect answer, but a definite, easy to understand, unambiguous answer. And that's one of the things that the UCC gives us. So, um... We want to have one answer across all the states, and we want it to be clear and unambiguous. So what happened was, you know, uh, just a little brief history, I guess, of, of how we got to the UCC. Let's go back to, say, 1700. Uh, most likely, if we were living in 1700, be it in England or, I guess, in the American colonies, um, we were probably living in a small town or maybe even in a rural area. I mean, there were cities like New York City and London and other places, but most people didn't live in them. And so let's say that I was a farmer, most people probably were, and um, I uh, needed to buy uh, some uh, farm implements. Or maybe I needed to buy a, a few yards of, of cloth to make some clothes. Let's, let's say that, that might be easier. So I go to the general store. How often do I go to the general store? Probably not that often. Um, I probably am largely a subsistence farmer. Um, you know, I grow the food that I eat, um, but there are a few things I need to buy. Maybe I go to the store um, and make a transaction once a month, maybe twice a month. I don't know what that would be, but it's not a routine thing. And when I do it, it's kind of a big deal in my life. I mean, I don't do it commonly. And so um, when I do it, I think, pretty long and hard about it. I don't buy frivolously like maybe, honestly, maybe I might today in this world when I'm at the Walmart buy some things I don't really need. But in, in the environment of 1700s, I'm probably thinking very carefully about buying this. This is kind of a big deal when I buy something. And so um, um, what what, what, what happened in that world was that um, the transactions were local and they were kind of well considered uh, between the parties. 
Um, and they were people acting face to face that probably knew each other, that had a history with each other. Now fast forward to say 1960. We're in a really different world. Um, uh, we've we've uh, gone through World War II. Uh, many Americans had had the opportunity through very difficult circumstances, of course, but had had the opportunity to go abroad to see a bit of the world. Maybe it was in the uh, Asian theater, maybe it was in the European theater. Uh, they developed a, maybe a little bit more cosmopolitanness. They come back to the United States. Uh, perhaps they're more open to moving around. Uh, we've developed a highway system, so it's easier for um, uh, uh, commerce to happen across state lines for people to move and for stuff to move. Um, air travel is taking over. That's a more common way of, of moving things. Certainly there's trains. And so suddenly it's really possible that I might be buying things from a different part of the world. Going back to 1700s, that cloth I bought, maybe not the cloth, but let's say I bought eggs from, from the mercantile. Those eggs are probably eggs that were laid by a chicken in my state. But fast forward to uh, the 21st century, very likely those that, the, the eggs that I buy, number one, I buy it from a grocery store most likely, and that grocery store probably is based in some state other than Texas. And the eggs that I buy at that grocery store may have been laid by chickens in other states, and the company that owned uh, the chickens and therefore owns the eggs is probably based in another state. Uh, those eggs were shipped to this grocery store. The shipping company that uh, transported the eggs, again, is probably based in another state. The clerk who is completing my transaction is probably a Texan, um, but he or she may not have lived in Texas for that long, and I probably have never met this person, don't really have a, an opinion one way or the other about their honesty or their character, and they don't really have an opinion about me one way or the other. It's a very different transaction with very different expectations, and so as a result, the rules that we had in 1700 were great rules for that era, but they may not really fit the economy we have today given the technological differences and also the cultural and socioeconomic differences that we have. So that's what um, the, the drafters of the Uniform Commercial Code were seeking to address. They were saying, Let, let's update how we do this so that uh, we, we're coming up with the best answers. Again, we're not focusing too much on the best. What we really want is a definite answer, but you know, if we're gonna come up with an answer, might as well come up with the best, right? And we, but more importantly than the best, we want something that we can get general agreement across all 50 states and all 50 states will adopt it. So what they did, what these legal scholars did was they looked at all the 50 states. They tried to, to find, well, gosh, it, it ends up that Pennsylvania has a really good answer on this particular issue. Oh, and let's see here. Um, um, Illinois has a really creative solution to this problem. Oh, look, South Carolina has a really interesting idea. And so they're able to look at best practices. And not just in the United States, but they can look at Canada, they can look at Japan, they can look at um, Egypt, they can look anywhere and find awesome answers in differing parts of the world. And they can bring that all together and come up with best practices across various ge geographies. And that's what they did. They came up with what they thought were the best answers for uh, modern um, economies, modern Western American economies. And so then they, they've drafted this uniform commercial code, but you know what? They're not done. They have to persuade the states to adopt this uniform commercial code um, because a state has the right to say, no, thanks, but no thanks. I mean, after all, the people who are marketing this law, they're just private citizens. Uh, they can't force a state to say, you've got to adopt this law. I mean, they can say that, but it's not going to work. The legislators are the ones who say yes or no. So each state had a choice to make. They could say, yeah, we love this uniform commercial code. We're going to adopt it just as you wrote it. That's one answer they could have. Or they could say, we hate it this is awful, we already have a, a, our own commercial code, that's what we want to stay with, it's, it's great, and we love it, and so leave us alone. That's another choice they had. 
or they could do something in the middle. They could say, well, you know what, we like it, but we don't love it. There's certain parts that make sense, but we kind of also like what we're doing. So we're going to kind of mix and match. And so that's kind of a, a middle course. Um, as a practical matter, most states did the first choice, pretty much adopt all of it, but they have just a tiny bit of that middle choice. Maybe most states adopted 95, 96% of it. Um, so there are some variations, but there's a lot of consistency across the states. And we can see that with interstate transactions becoming more common with the Amazons and the Walmarts of the world, we need to have a single answer to those issues as I talked about. Uh, before it, it certainly reduces transaction costs and reduces uncertainty. The part of the UCC that we're going to focus on is Article 2, and this has to do with domestic sales of goods. What I like to call stuff. All the things you would buy from Amazon, not actually not all the things you, there's some stuff that Amazon stock, stocks that is not a good as that term is defined. We'll talk about what, what a good is later on, but this is, this is an important category. And in fact, uh, the UCC is actually a rather long document and we're literally just going to focus on this one part of this larger document. So you may say, well, if the UCC talks about the domestic sale of goods, what is the common law? What's left for the common law to do? Because I said before, most of the stuff we're going to talk about, of course, is common law stuff. So what's the part that isn't goods? And that is services. So if you hire me to paint your barn, for example, that would count as a service, so that would be under the UCC, excuse me, under the common law, not under the UCC. But if you came to me and said, I don't want you to paint my barn, but I want you to sell me the paint that you manufacture, well, then that is a good. The paint would be the good. The act of painting would be the service. So selling the paint to you is a UCC issue. Selling the service of painting the barn is a common law issue. Now, you may be thinking to yourself, gosh, it seems like I spend a lot more time buying stuff than I do buying services. So how come you're not spending most of the time in this course talking about the UCC and just a little bit on the common law? Um, well, I see where you're going there, and you're probably right that the common law is in some sense um, the lesser in terms of the actual quantity of transactions that the average person engages in. But the UCC is largely based upon the common law. For about, I'd say, I'm going to ballpark you here, but I'd say probably 80% of the UCC is just the, the drafter saying, we just want to say in a statutory form what the common law says. And then there's about 20% that the drafter says, you know, we're going to go a different way because of technological or cultural changes. We're going to vary from what the common law says. So there's some differences. There's also a lot of similarities. So we talk about the common law, not because services are so much more important than goods, but because the UCC is mainly just a fancified version of the common law. We see that Article 2 exists in all the states except for one, Louisiana. So you may think, well, why doesn't Louisiana, why is it the outlier? And of course, it has to do with historical reasons. Um, in the first lecture, we talked about how um, we have the civil code jurisdictions and the common law jurisdictions. And I said how, well, places where um, there's a lot of people whose first language is English, those are places typically that used to be part of Great Britain and that have the common law tradition. Um, and, and that is true. Uh, but Louisiana is different. You may recall in 1803, President Jefferson uh, purchased Louisiana from Napoleon. And it, at that time, Louisiana, not just the state of Louisiana, but a whole swath of, of the middle part of our country was part of France. And as a result of that, it had a civil code, just like France does today. And so when it became part of the United States, it could have said, gee whiz, we want to adopt the common law. We think the common law is better than the civil code. But the Louisianans decided not to. They thought that 
you know, hey, we've got a good system. It's working. We've got a pretty sophisticated economy to switch uh, midstream would be pretty stressful, pretty bad for the economy. So we're just going to stay with what's working. If it isn't broken, let's not worry about fixing it. That could have happened in Texas, too. Because obviously, before we became a republic, we were part of Mexico. Mexico had a civil code system, um, but when we fought our war of independence and became an, our own republic, we had to uh, we had to address that same issue that Louisiana did. Uh, Texans chose a different path. Texans said, "You know what? Most of us who were living in Texas at the time, or at least most of the decision makers, said." We're from common law jurisdictions originally. We've only lived in Texas for a little while. We're originally from Alabama or Massachusetts or Kentucky or wherever we were from. And those places were common law jurisdictions. And so we, what's more familiar to us is the common law. As a result, Texas chose for the most part to uh, switch to a common law system. But we still have a few remnants of the Civil Code. It's beyond the course of the scope to talk about it. But one example of the Civil Code is a community property. Uh, so we do still have some remnants. But again, I'm kind of uh, somewhat going off track here. Louisiana is a Civil Code jurisdiction, so therefore it doesn't have our common law tradition. And because of that, because the UCC is largely a codification of the common law, um, Louisiana, since it doesn't have the common law, uh, did not want to adopt the UCC because it's a very different system than what they have been using very successfully for hundreds of years. And so that's why Louisiana is different. Another jurisdiction in the United States that doesn't have the UCC is Puerto Rico. Uh, Puerto Rico also has a civil code tradition. Again, we'll talk a lot more about the Article 2 as we progress in the semester. Let me just pull it up so you can see what it looks like. Okay, here we go. Um, so here we have, this is, this is part of the Texas Business and Commerce Code, and you can see it's a code. So these are going to be all of the statutes. Here are all the sections of the um, Business and Commerce Code. All the statutes that have to do with business and commerce are going to be found in this one code. So a code is just an organized set of statutes. And we're looking at... We said here we're looking at Article 2. Well, we don't actually call it Article 2 in Texas. We call it Chapter 2. But it's the same thing. It's sales, right, here. Um, and you can see our short title for it is, this chapter may be cited as Uniform Commercial Code-Sales. <coughs> so this is exactly what... Um, we were talking about, and this is this the whole article too. I mean, it's not short, but compared to, um, uh, you know, I mean, it's not super long. That's a matter of, of several pages, but certainly not anything re re outrageously long. Okay, so let's move on. Ah, here's an example of, of a little book about uh, the Uniform Commercial Code. You can say this is a nutshell book. We'll talk about nutshells in a second. Um, that, this is um, a paperback book series. There's lots of books in this series, and, and these are uh, handy references, especially for people going to law school but they can also be very helpful for people in paralegal program. You can, uh, the, our, our uh, library on the Spring Creek campus carries many of these nutshell type books. They are not small enough to fit in a pocket, but they're about the size of kind of a large paperback. Um, and they are a paperback book. They're much more cheap than our textbooks. Unfortunately, our textbooks are, are more expensive. Okay, so now let's flip gears and talk about uh, consumer-based laws. We're not going to spend a ton of time talking about consumer-based laws, but these laws do um, interact with contract law. Um, probably the biggest area that we see uh, relevance is going to be in the area of warranties. Um, uh, the, the important statute in this area is a federal statute, and it's called the Magnuson Moss Warranty Act. 
Uh, again, this is much, much less important to our course than the UCC, but this is a statute that we will spend one chapter talking about fairly significantly. So I would say this is probably the second most important statute, but much less, uh, much less important than the UCC. So we will talk about the statute again. It's called the Magnuson Moss Warranty Act, and it applies to warranties for household products. So if you buy, say, a hair dryer at Walmart, this warranty applies to, or this statute applies to that uh, particular transaction. We also have state warranty laws or lemon laws, um, especially about things like buying used cars, things along those lines. And Texas also has these types of protections. Um, of course, these transactions are also contracts. So warranty law applies to them, but also just general contract UCC law applies to these transactions. So even when there isn't a warranty issue, it doesn't necessarily mean that there isn't going to be some level of redress for the consumer. Here's uh, three statutes. We're not going to spend really almost any time on these, but I'm just kind of throwing these out there as things of interest. These are even less important than the Magnuson Moss statute. Uh, the first one is, again, we see it's a uniform code. So this is one of these laws that um, legal scholars developed and then marketed to the various states. And uh, Texas did adopt this statute. And this statute addresses electronic signatures um, and discusses how electronic signatures should be documented and how those records ought to be retained. E-Sign is a federal law, again, about those same issues. Um, uh, it allows there to be these e-transactions. Obviously, we didn't see these types of statutes until we had the internet, for example. And then there's the UCITA. This has not been adopted broadly. This is a, a much less important statute. Um, I'm just throwing these out here just to show you some of the legal developments, but this is not a big uh, factor in our course. Um, chapter 16 discusses uh, some of these issues. It is a, not a a chapter that we cover directly in the course. Um, so uh, there's more to be learned in that chapter about these topics. Okay, so let's talk about where do we find the law. We've already talked about cases and we talked about how you find cases in reporters. You can also nowadays find cases on the internet. Uh, statutes, again, they're going to also be in books. Uh, the, the, the name, the colloquial or common name for statutes in Texas is Vernon's, but again, you can also find statutes on the internet. The restatements are a little bit more difficult to find. Uh, most law libraries don't carry them because they're not inexpensive. Unfortunately, our library does not have it, um, and they aren't available online for free because obviously the publisher wants to make money. Uh, so these are a little bit more challenging to get uh, one's hands on. Um, there are also legal, legal treatises, and again, here you can see the term is in red, so the definition is in parentheses here. What is a legal treatise? It is a scholarly book on a specific legal topic, and it usually is more than just one volume. Um, uh, so it, it uh, is something you probably won't uh, interact with a lot in your professional life as a paralegal, um, but there definitely could be times where you would be doing some research and you'd want to look at a legal treatise. It's more common, honestly, to be looking in cases and statutes um, than legal treatises, but certainly this is a resource uh, to think about. Um, um, ALR is a legal treatise that occurs to me um, that it can be useful. Horn books. These are legal books, again, that summarize a particular legal topic. Um, example of that would be Prosser on Torts, a book that is focused on a particular topic. Um, uh, you could say that our textbooks are kind of like a horn book, um, although most people probably wouldn't exactly use that term because it's not... Um, it's a little bit more informal, I guess, in format than, than what we usually think of as a horn book. But it's kind of analogous to that. And of course, we have um, the nutshell books that I just kind of showed you the topic, like the cover of this one right here. Um, these are really useful books. I think virtually all law students at some point has, have, have looked over some, some nutshells, and I certainly earned, owned some when I was in law school. But there's certainly not things you could cite as an attorney, excuse me, as an authority to court. 
Um, then we have law reviews and uh, State Bar Journal. State Bar Journal articles are designed to be very kind of short and practical. Law reviews are more theoretical um, and a little bit more arcane, I guess you could say, not quite as practically oriented. Um, you, can find the, you can find the State Bar Journal online. Let me just show you actually the State Bar Journal for Texas to go and um, I'm going to take you into this. Uh, obviously I'm a member of the bar, but you don't have to be a member of the bar to access any of these resources. You just go to texasbar.com and we're going to go into news and publications. Then we're going to go down to the Texas Bar Journal. Um, we'll look, oops, what did I do there? Oh, okay, I need to do, I guess I'll go to this. Here we go. So um, you can flip through, let me see if I can just show you what, a, what an easy article. Maybe I should have done the, the tutorial before I clicked on this. Ah, oh, let's look at this one. Uh, so this is an article about cybersecurity compliance and you can see it probably makes up two or three pages. It's designed to be very um, practical and very um, uh, information that, that the law, law firm can immediately uh, use and, and uh, think, hey, I'm getting value for my uh, membership in the bar, that type of thing. Um, Okay, uh, legal encyclopedias uh, are basically just encyclopedias about a legal topic. So they're like, um, in many respects, like Wikipedia. I mean, obviously they're professionally written. Um, they're not kind of crowdsourced, but um, they are uh, uh, designed to be an introduction to various legal topics. We are fortunate in that we do have uh, Texas Jurisprudence, the third edition, which is commonly called Texture, which is pronounced texture. Um, we have that on the Spring Creek campus. Um, it's probably the most widely used one in the state of Texas, and it um, gives you a nice overview about a particular topic. It's not going to give you a deep dive, and obviously this is a secondary source. No judge wrote it. No legislature wrote it. It's written by a private for-profit company, but it's a, it's a nice uh, beginning point, especially if you're, pra if you're doing some research in an, in an area that you don't ordinarily practice in. It can kind of give you the lay of the land so you can see how the various pieces fit together. You're probably not going to be able to conclude your resource just having looked at Texas, Texas jurisprudence, but it's a good starting point. Another good tool to use, whether you're practicing in contracts or some other area, are form books. Um, these are used all the time by legal professionals, and this is where you start not with a blank piece of paper, but you start with somebody else's or perhaps your own document. So when you're writing a contract, it would be pretty rare that somebody would say, you know what, I'm gonna start from scratch. No, you're gonna start from some source document and probably more than one source document. You're gonna maybe have three or four contracts that you hobble together. You like paragraph 47 of this contract, but you like paragraph 93 of that contract. And you hobble them together, you cut out the stuff you don't need, you redraft areas. There's probably gonna be a few areas you're just gonna to have to completely write from scratch. But your client doesn't really want to pay for you to rewrite everything. That's going to be really, really expensive. Plus, there's something to be said for borrowing from stuff that has worked in the past. Um, because um, if you write it on your own, maybe you won't have thought through some of the issues that somebody else had thought through and, and had come up with a solution to. So, you know, more, uh, more minds, uh, uh, you know, uh, coming together can come up with a better solution. Um, people come up or uh, 
develop the contracts that they're going to, to work from in lots of different ways. Of course, one source of contracts uh, that you could use to for this purpose would be uh, previous deals that you've been involved with. Another could be, um, in a, if you're in a, a law firm, um, deals that other attorneys or paralegals have been involved with. Um, you could, uh, you know, use their contracts. You can also, uh, there are form books of contracts that you could use um, that could be a very useful um, uh, uh, thing to start from. And you can, you know, buy even uh, model contracts and things along those lines. Um, a form book that is useful not so much for um, developing contracts but more maybe litigating over a contract would be Dorsanio's. Um, Dorsanio is a, a Texas-based um, law professor, uh, William Dorsanio. I don't know if he's he was at SMU, if he's still practicing or not. Anyway, he has written a, a Texas litigation guide. That's the uh, the name on the spine of the book, but nobody calls it that. People call it Dorsanios. Some people call it Dorsanios, some people call it Dorsanios. I'm not sure which is correct. Um, I didn't go to SMU Law School. I guess if I did, I would know, but um, uh, because the name of the book is so bland, nobody calls it this. They call it Dorsanios. A very helpful form book for lots of different purposes. We actually have one on the Spring Creek campus, so if you want to, when I say we have one, it's actually probably about a 20 volume uh, book. There are kind of a, a uh, light blue color. Um, so that's a that's what a form book is, um, and that this is an example of one. And of course, we have websites. There's lots of different websites that um, uh, cover uh, information. Uh, we can, so I've shown you before where you can find cases, and I've shown you where you can find statutes, um, and also we have fee-based services like Westlaw and Lexis. Of course, in our program currently, we're using Westlaw. That could change in the future, but that's a fee-based service that you can get a lot of uh, cool resources from in addition to the things that the government actually creates. I hope that this information has been helpful for you. As always, please reach out to me if you have questions, email me, or come by my office hours. I'll be glad to spend more time fleshing out the details. Um, I know sometimes people are a little reluctant to come to see their instructor. It can be a little bit intimidating. Um, but uh, my goal is to be as approachable as I can. I want to get to know you. I want to get to know what your concerns are and how I can provide as much support as possible. So don't be a stranger. Come by with your questions or just to chat and maybe talk about career plans or something else cool. So I look forward to seeing you as the semester progresses. Thanks for your attention. Have a wonderful day.